I'm going to give you a quick glimpse of uh, some work by Dr. Edie Kendall and Dr. Brian Cleveley. Um, the, this, they have motion captured eight different children with pathologic gait. Mm -hmm. And so now a student can wander into the clinic, can walk around, turn, they can go first person view or third person view. And actually we're going to convert this little checklist to utilize probably the Edinburgh. And so the student would then go through and start doing observational gait analysis of pediatrics, walking around from the front, walking around from the rear, and then trying to go through a systematic process of gait analysis. Now, the cool thing is that this can either be done together in class, you can check the right answers versus the wrong answers, and this can also be done asynchronously. So now that we've built this idea of what normal gait is, we can now transpose it to pediatric gait and eventually have them play with it on their own and develop a habit of movement analysis. So this is one of the things that we're actually working on to bring, uh, bring out to all the faculty as well as the students. Um, and we're experimenting with a lot of cool different ways to do it. In fact, one of the ways that we, I have on my phone is you can just, you know, open your camera, you're pointing it at your dinner table, and this little girl is walking across your dinner, dinner table. So it's kind of augmented reality. And now yeah. the students can do that in any yeah. environment and enjoy this process of, wow, I am so glad someone taught me how to analyze gait. And huh. I'm seeing kids with CP. Mm. I'm seeing a kid with a stroke. I'm seeing kids with low tone. Um, and so this, this is one of the, the cool things that we've been thinking about one of the reasons why Edie had filmed the, had motion captured these kids was because some of them may not want to be used as examples forever. But now that we've captured their movement and applied an avatar over these movements, now we can safely use them and use their contribution indefinitely. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts or questions about that? Okay. So then I'm going to let James share a few things about what you faced teaching GATE for 26 years. You know, the, the, the um, challenge with GATE, we have it kind of early in the first third of the curriculum in the programs I've taught it or whatever. And it's kind of been the, the jump off class for the students. And I like it because it really challenges them to make some critical decisions. You have got to... You will, you will, your hands, palpatory inspection, and with joint mobile and mobility assessment. Your eyes are very important also. And so the challenge, though, is that typically human movement, it happens so fast that if you don't videotape it and then slow it down to watch it, um, you got to kind of discipline their eye. If any of the physical therapists were maybe coaches in sports before, they've learned, uh, you know, that, that what coaches eye, and it's not the program that, that I end up. Uh, we were talking about on the chat room here in terms of another program to capture stuff, but but to be able to then ingrain the um, uh, the complex movements and usually you know the best example I have is gait. We've really that agnosium you know with Rancho and, and the Mayo clinics and the folks up in Gillette up in, in, in Minnesota, you know, and then probably the next best one is maybe scapular humeral rhythm, you know, and, and and that gets identified the Shirley Sharp and stuff like that. But can you take these complex movements and simplify them and give them a template, a, a kind of a mental algorithm to start um, uh, um, displaying the way they watch people move? Uh, go back one slide real quick, Mikey, so I can see the second and third point. So I, I did. Then the other thing is the standardization of patient examples. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've had to try to mimic a hemiplegic gait patient walking across the stage and have the students look at that. And so... Um, you know, going on YouTube and trying to find examples uh, is kind of a crapshoot, and, and if I don't get dizzy watching them. And then the next one is then the last one is finally making it stick, you know, giving it clinical relevance. So so they, they, they learn it, they don't memorize it. You know, they'll have a plethora of what are all the gait, what could be the, the muscle skeletal faults that cause um, a hip hiking or, or this, that, and pathological stuff like that. But instead of memorizing, be able to think it through and understand it. And I pitch it to them that if you get it to there, you are now studying for your board exam. If you ingrain it, 
and make it permanent knowledge, you know, permanent learning, making it stick, I think is very helpful. So that's where I think these apps, in the last three years of my teaching, full-time teaching, I still do teaching, but now I'm doing other uh, uh, goals in my life. Uh, this app is one of them. You know, to, 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 to have these um, videos and have these apps to augment the learning, not replace me or the instructor, but to really help make that learning more efficient. I put a comment on the um, chat box saying, okay, so movement analysis is an important component to curriculum. Where do we fit it in into an already impacted curriculum? Do we reteach it or do we just tell them how to use the tools they learned early on? And so, so that's the thing there. So simplifying complex movements, I call the scapula, I call the shoulder girdle a, a complex yet simple movement. It's complex because there's a lot of things going on, but simple because we have it pretty much broken down to what has to happen. Same thing with gait. And we're fortunate to stand on the shoulders of giants, Jackie Perry out here in the West Coast, obviously. You know, it's been very helpful in terms of um, getting the students learning how to do movement analysis. And, and, and it's funny because um, I forget if this Christine or Cheryl said, you know, they look at it from all three sides of that. So it's the same mental discipline and learning that they just use over and over again. You, you learn how to change brakes on a Ford. It's the same as similar to a Chevy or Toyota, I think. So, so you know, the functional task is gate. If you want to go to the next one, we have the objective phases there. Uh, the critical events, mm -hmm. um, the muscle activity, and then joint movement. Now, replace the word gait there with sit to stand or, you know, um, getting up from a chair or stuff like that. And I think that can really help us in terms of not reinventing the wheel, but just tighten the spokes for the different functional activities. And so um, what we used to teach it here, I mean, here's old school. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. You know, the, the, the two-dimensional black and white, you know, here you go. You know, and all the memorizations, and then you know. But now, instead of that, you have this, and we have the different phases, the range of motion, the EMG, and the critical events. So, what I was going to say here, James, was that we, based on our earlier conversation, when we built the Gate app, which at the time I was selfishly already thinking forward, like we are having a problem in ortho, talking about why people have low back pain, because it's really hard to describe what a normal and abnormal forward bend is or return from bend and also it it's hard to for students to understand what even one how to look at a forward bend what kind of tissue stresses abnormal or in non-optimal forward bend might cause to disc ligament or muscles and so selfishly as we built this we decided that in the beginning phases of teaching someone complex human movements it needs to be static and so in the app here you'll see that we use the human form and we go from phase to phase and you can just click as though you're watching a comic book as a patient moves from phase to phase you can look at these these uh, the description of the phases and then James as we talked about before the muscle activity graphs always stressed me out yeah, I mean, the, the students go, oh, my God, i got to memorize this for the test, you know, and, and you know, have an appreciation of the movement activities. But instead now, and then, and then if you have a graph or, or a narrative form, but now the students are just like this. <laughs> yeah. not, I mean, you're talking to the back, you end up talking to the back wall. I mean, it, it's almost like how do students connect with this? Mm -hmm. You know, it, is it meaningful without the body? stopped in that moment so that I could make sense of what muscle was firing in that moment. What task was that muscle trying to achieve? So back to the new school, this time we decided that we would use the motion capture equipment and allow the instructor to take the video and tie it to the range of motion requirements for each phase. Right? You could stop the video at any point in time and talk about what do you see? What's the ankle doing? What's the hip doing? What's the knee doing? Now what's the knee doing? So I think that takes it one step. It's this next step of graded exposure was that we could look at the range of motion requirements in isolation, in static images. And now it was time to release, to kind of turn their eyes into slow motion and allow them to process it at the next level. What it does here is like I'll stop them at a point and say, 
What phase are they coming from? Where are they going to? Is that isometric, concentric, or eccentric activity? And then they understand. They can see the person go, oh, I see where the glute meat's got to be isometric in the frontal plane, or I'm going to have my foot drag. Or if it's concentric, it's hip hiking to compensate for a leg length discrepancy or something. But when they see it with a picture and the graphs there, rather than the other you know, two-dimensional graph and just the narrative things, it didn't stick. This does. And I'm very lucky to have had this the last couple of years of my teaching. So this actually is available already to all of you professors. Uh, later, I'll, I'll share with you your login that you can pull this up anytime in your gate class and have this and talk about the muscles that are firing and why and what happens. What is the consequence when an anterior tib doesn't work anymore? Um, I think Cheryl or Christina had talked about looking at multiple views. And so for all of these patients and all of these deviations, we would film real time, so real speed or slow speed close up. You could change views. Mm. And, and the thing that these views do, it's a standardization of patient. I, the camera's nice and still, we got good focus, we got good emphasis on the joints. And so it's way better than trying to find something on YouTube that might fix or fit what I need. Which ties yeah. into this idea of how many of us have spent countless hours floating around YouTube looking for videos that we thought we could potentially use. And so again, the team decided, hey, we have patients. Let's bring the patients in. Let's try to get some good footage so that instructors and students could revisit it over and over again. So by the time you said, yeah, I think this is a good video, but oftentimes the quality and, um, and the availability, I think, for a faculty, right, to be able to pull it up at any point and say, by the way, students, you have this in your pocket. You can revisit this at any point in time. So here what we've done is under analyze for the deviations, we grabbed real patients to demonstrate common deviations so that we would not have to search anymore. And so usually we would pick the view that would have the would best represent, in this case, um, um, this posterior view. And we talked about the associated phase, some potential causes, which I think helps us to bridge the gap to ortho or neuro where we can talk about the impairments and the impairment hunt. So I also feel like it's important to begin to build bridges forward and back. So all the common deviations and then I think Cheryl you said you teach prosthetic uh, gait. Mm -hmm. So here we went and had a couple of professors come in and we filmed all the prosthetic gait deviations. And actually, I just used that. That's fantastic. It's fantastic. This was the first time um, this semester. That's great. And I think that's, uh, and that ties in, Jim, to the last point about clinical relevance. So faculty wrote in and said, hey, that would be great if we could have cases that we could use to have discussions in class. Because now that they've learned to analyze this gate, why don't we create context and build a connection. So we're using this already in early or in early curriculum because they kind of have heard of people with, you know, anterior tib, you know, t you know medial tibial stress syndrome or IT band syndrome. And so it allows us to say, hey, let's look at this patient case. So students kind of re-engage, you know, they're like, oh, this is interesting oh, this is why it was so valuable for me to learn how to analyze these movements. And so I'm just by doing this, I'm introducing them to what a orthopedic objective exam might look like. And we basically are able to have some pretty cool discussions. And I will ask them, from the basic things you already know, what do you think we might want to examine in this person's really high arch? oh, I wonder if they have good enough dorsiflexion. 
Oh, I wonder if they have rigidity of the midfoot. Oh, I wonder if they have, you know, enough shock absorption during uh, loading response. So it, I think it, it allows for us to showcase our expertise and actually kind of tease them a little bit further. So I think that ties to the third point about making it stick. There, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of um, mechanisms electronically and, and through uh, the new media stuff to information disseminate. But I think what this Visual U app does in all their apps, they go through that clinical application side where it doesn't just give them information, but teaches them how to process that information too. It gives them a, a template and a, a map for how to start thinking through. And so it kind of walks them through very nicely and prepares them to think. And not only just only for gait, but I think it's that, again, it goes back to that permanent learning in terms of how to watch how, how humans move. And now, now, I think as physical therapists, we're recognizing as movement experts, it's more than gait that we get to attend for our, our patients, too. So that's where I really enjoyed using that app for so much. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, Jim, could you take a look at the comments to see if there are any comments? Any comments about that before we, I show you a glimpse of what we're doing in the fun functional movement app? Any thoughts? Or how you've been using it, Cheryl? Or Cheryl? Um... Well, actually, with the um, with the gate for prosthetics, I just used it to demonstrate the um, the deviations this this time around. Because yes. you know, because um, I'm still kind of playing with how best to utilize it in class, um, and kind of thinking that through. Yeah. Um, and you know, having. I like the app because there is the potential for every student to have the app and be able to go back and look at it even after we've covered it in class. Of course, this semester, I didn't have the students all get the app. So, you know, I have some other resources for them to be able to go back and look at. But I think ideally, and this is just what's been running around in my head, is having them all have the app so that they could go back, do some analysis and then come back with discussion, um, too. Yeah. So, but that didn't happen this year. Yeah, that's fine. And I would say this is this is actually the right process. So the faculty first has to vet the content and actually play with it and familiarize themselves. I mean, I built the app, and it took time to figure out how to integrate it into my classroom. Um, and then it's really again, you you kind of tease it out. Here is a piece that I'm comfortable with, that I think augments what I'm doing to be better. And I just try it. And from there, what you will find is you become a little confident. You build some confidence in, in, in the software, but you also build your confidence in the reaction of the students and the achievement of the learning uh, objectives. And then you go, you know what, I'm going to try that with a little bit more with a different part of the app or some other some other app period. And so mm -hmm. I think that that's the right process. It, you know, you never convert directly like textbooks are gone. We're going to apps. Totally not the right way to go about it. Mm -hmm. I really think mm -hmm. it needs to be carefully teased in and and we use the apps for its where it is strong, where it brings strengths into the learning. And then we don't use it when we need more depth or when we need more focus on a certain area. Because I never designed the apps to be the encyclopedia. I designed it to serve a purpose. And a lot of it was tied to motor skill and movement analysis. You know, where the books just can't do that job very well. 